Hello, everyone. A very good afternoon to you. Hope you are staying safe during this time. I'm Phoebe Nunes, Trade Manager at the British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, or BMCC as we are known. I would like to welcome you to BMCC's trade webinar series. Today's topic is why hire during the pandemic crisis? Look for the silver lining. We are very honored to have with us today a distinguished panel consisting of the Malewa Group Executive Chairman, Yang Mulya Tunku Dato Sri Dr. Iskanda bin Tunku Abdullah. Hello, Tunku. Thank you for joining us. We are also very honored to have the CEO of Perkeso or SOXO, our social security organization, Yang Berbahagia Dato Sri Dr. Muhammad Azman bin Dato Aziz Muhammad. Welcome Dato Sri, thank you for joining. And a warm welcome to the Executive Director of the Malaysian Employers Federation, MEF, Yang Berbahagia Dato Haji Shamsuddin Bardan. Welcome Dato. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. From Malewa Learning Resources, Direct English Malaysia, we are delighted to welcome Yang Berbahagia Dato Aminatun Karim, Ambassador, Cross Cultural Communicator, and Certified Trainer. Welcome, Dato. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Hi. Hi, everyone. Moderating our session for today will be our very own CEO of BMCC, Ms. Jennifer Lopez. Thank you, Jen, for attending. Before we go to the panel discussion, I'm very pleased to introduce to you our speakers for today, Mr. Philip Lim, General Manager of Malewa Learning Resources. They are the Master Licensee of Direct English UK in Malaysia and Singapore. Welcome, Philip. Thank you for joining us. I'm also pleased to introduce Mr. Henry Law, speaking on behalf of Cambridge Assessment English. Henry is the director of the Cambridge Linguiskill Operations in Malaysia. Welcome, Henry. Thank you for coming today. And last but not least, I am delighted to welcome Ms. Gayatri Vadivel, head of employment services department at Perkeso. Welcome, Gayatri. Thank you for coming. Once again, a huge thank you to all our speakers and panelists for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. There will be two segments to this web webinar. The first segment will be presentations by our three speakers. And the second segment will be a panel discussion with our four esteemed panel members. After the panel discussion, there will be an audience Q&A. Before we start the session, a little bit of housekeeping. Please be forthcoming with your questions during this session and send it in through the Q&A function available at the bottom of your screen instead of in the public chat function. We will attempt to address your questions if time permits. So without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Gayatri Vadivel from Perkeso to begin the session. She will be presenting on Panjana Kurjaya 2.0, Start Hiring. Over to you, Gayatri. Thank you, Phoebe, for the kind introduction and thank you, BMCC, for inviting us for us to share with you the hiring incentives in particular and why hire during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can hear me clearly, Phoebe, for now? Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. So we have the My Future Jobs. You would have heard during the budget announcement. We would have heard of the hiring incentives. So just let me enlighten you in terms of what are the features of these hiring incentives. Yes. Next slides, please. So just to give you some perspective or context into how the hiring incentives came about, as you can see, the unemployment rate where it was relatively stable at 3.3% in quarter one of 2020, right up to quarter four of 2019, when we saw you know, a relatively stable unemployment rate, but it kind of increased in quarter one 2020 when the pandemic set in, we saw 3.5% and then a steep increase 
of uh, up to 5.1% in Q2 of 2020. And looking at the, uh, the loss of employment data that SOXO has itself, we have seen a steep increase as well, of more than 50% of increase in compared to the numbers that we had in 2019, where it was 40,084 applications for loss of unemployment benefits. And you know, industries were quite badly hit due to the, the, you know, the economic impact of the pandemic. And we saw sectors like manufacturing, the wholesale, retail, accommodation and services, where usually you see that these services are very much in the blooming side, but due to the pandemic, they were greatly hit. So the only thing that we thought of, you know, we had several things in place and we wanted to run it out in a very structured manner. And you know, next slide, Phoebe, if you can have the next slide. Yeah, so we were very much, you know, gifted in terms of our role as a social protection organization to be part and parcel of providing these incentives to reduce the burden of the economy, particularly the employers and the employees as well. Uh, we started off in March 2020 when we had the employment retention program. Just when the pandemic kicked in, we were quite swift enough to provide the uh, non-paid leave uh, benefits, which is about 600 ringgit for up to three months for all these, uh, I mean, for those who were affected, then came into place the wage subsidy program uh, 1.0. We had a series, we had an extension through a couple of other announcements, 2.0, 3.0. And the one that I would like to feature today is the hiring incentives. Uh, and why we are providing the hiring incentive is because, as you can see the timeline on this slide, we can see the progression of how we have moved on during these times of the pandemic, starting from the, re, you know, uh, in terms of recovery, following by the revitalization and towards transformation. So right now I would say that we're in between the recovery and the revitalization, where as we are moving towards a greater economic productivity, it is time for employers and, and you know, the, uh, the businesses that are ready or striving that can be a part in providing uh, job opportunities or to create jobs for those who have been unemployed in particular. Next slide, please. So speaking of which, we have the hiring incentives in which the main platform that we are using to provide uh, employment opportunities is the My Future Jobs portal. For your information, the My Future Jobs portal has been recognized as the one-stop employment portal to do job matching between you know, uh, candidates who are seeking for employment as well as employers who are looking for candidates. And the My Future Jobs portal is based on the public employment services framework where we have taxonomies in place, we have uh, job matching algorithms that are skewed towards competencies and skills, as opposed to most of the uh, job portals that are out there, which are very much keyword based search. And the good thing about this portal is that it also features uh, case management services, we have employment services officers who not only looks at you know, improvising the skill sets of unemployed individuals. What we do is that when we meet them, we ask them what the employment gaps are, what are the things that we need to look at. You know, sometimes they've not done a resume for over five years and then they become retrenched and they're like, how am I to do a resume that will be creative enough or good enough for an employee to, to have a look at or to even be pleased with? So this is where we have an employment services officer who actually looks at, you know, how we can look at uh, presenting a good resume, what are the employment gaps, you know, how do you address, we even do interview simulations, for example, uh, before we actually, actually uh, match them with jobs. And then we have on the other side, on the demand from employers, we have also key accounts available for uh, uh, employers for us to provide the services we understand. We try to understand what are the demands of the employer and try to match them with the competencies and skill sets that are available within our candidates with the portal. So I mean, predominantly the services is provided uh, to all our employment services uh, beneficiaries and not only that through our expansion on the scope of employment services especially during the launch of the panjana in june 2020 uh, we started also uh, providing these employment services to not only eis beneficiaries or soxo beneficiaries to also graduates uh, school leavers and anyone who comes to our place and, and you know knocks at the door and, and asking us for assistance in terms of job matching services uh, next please so I will not go in terms of the, the data and my CEO is around and he will be sharing with you on the outcome. I would like to focus on what it provides employers. I believe there are a lot of employers here today who are listening to us. And hence, I think this is the time. And you no, know, I think the question is why hire? So I think this is 
basically the answer to it. Uh, we're providing a number of incentives within the program. So there are a few components where the hiring incentives come in. Firstly, the financial incentives itself. Secondly, we have training programs available. We also have mobility assistance to encourage job seekers who are living you know, within a certain radius and just to incentivize them to come to where the jobs are. And on top of that, we also are looking at a Malaysianization scheme, which I will share shortly. But basically, the objective of these hiring incentives is to provide you know, a short-term you know, uh, employment opportunities to those who are seeking for employment through the apprenticeship, and also in terms of a long-term employment for those who are on the main category of the panjana. So if you allow me to just touch a little bit about the apprentices, so employers who are looking to employ apprentices, especially for those who are from school leavers or graduates, can get up to 3,000 ringgit for up to three months. So employers will only need to pay the balance 200 ringgit per month per individual as the government is providing a maximum 3,000 ringgit incentive for the apprentice concern. And you know what's the good news? I know there's no limit. You know, employers who are wanting to employ apprentices can employ as many apprentices as possible. Um, I'll move on to the second category, which is the below 40. For this particular category, employers are required to provide an employment contract of a minimum 12 months and incentives provided are up to 24,000. We have a base of between 40 and also 60% where it is calculated based on the maximum salary of 10,000 ringgit, which makes a maximum incentive between 4,000 ringgit and 6,000 ringgit, depending on the category. So for the below 40, we have the 40%, which provides a maximum of 24,000 up to six months for employers who are employing somebody who is unemployed and who is below 40. And we have another uh, category, which is above 40 in vulnerable groups, because we all know that it is rather challenging to employ these group of individuals. Hence, we have a 60% uh, you know, uh, incentive provided to employers who employ this group, and employers can get up to 36,000 worth of incentives for up to six months if they employ anyone who's an OKU, someone who was an ex, I mean, juvenile, but has completed all his uh, parole and, and is ready to uh, you know, come up to the labor market, single mothers, those who are on B40, uh, those who have been on prolonged unemployment, you know, graduates who have been prolonged employed for more than 180 days, they all fall in this group where employers can get right up to 36,000 ringgit for up to six months. And um, we have a new scheme. The, the enhancement of this 2.0 is that we have a scheme which is Malaysianization, which are very passionate about. This is because we have you know, a lot of uh, occupations which are still pretty much dependent on foreign uh, workers. So this Malaysianization scheme was introduced to encourage not only businesses to provide employment opportunities to those uh, commonly uh, taken up by foreign foreign uh, foreign workers, for example, cleaners, factory operators, and so on, but this is to entice them to provide these incentives and get our local talents to uh, apply for this this kind of jobs. But on top of that, apart from us providing the forty percent incentives to employers, we also have a twenty percent top up on top of what the the employee would be receiving as an incentive incentives so that they come forward and they apply for these jobs. But what we always encourage employers to do is that to look at some kind of rebranding, you know, for to entice our local graduates. For example, we've worked with some agricultural companies where, you know, instead of just plucking fruits using the conventional way, we have introduced them to trainings, uh, you know, into drone training so that they, they provide this drone traineeship and, and get them to be more upskilled, uh, give them a better name, drone pilot trainee, and, you know, that makes them very proud of the work that they do. And, in the, and, and it's a win-win. The employee gets something and the employer gets something Thing as well. So this is the financial incentives provided. And on top of that, not just the financial incentives, we also provide training provisions for those who are under the scheme. So as long as the unemployed individual, right, whether from the apprentice or from the other categories, if they have been uh, employed under the scheme, they also get provision of training programs. We have more than 6,000 training programs available for up for grab for employers to choose from and where apprentices have training programs worth 4,000 ringgit and the other categories have training programs worth up to 7,000 ringgit, which includes uh, professional certification. So meaning if someone was unemployed from a different category and you know he's employed into a new industry and re upskilling, reskilling, this is the time their employers to come aboard and employ these individuals, not only by us allowing you to or assisting you by reducing your financial burden through this financial assistive but also by us 
assisting or facilitating training programs that are available for us to support you in your hiring uh, um, you know, progression. And besides that, we also provide the job seeker, on the other hand, a mobility assistance, mob mobility assistance between 500 ringgit right up to 1000 ringgit. And this is a one-off assistance where the job seeker, every job seeker this time gets something, they get 500 ringgit, you know, for coming onto the scheme, for, you know, for their efforts, for searching for jobs, for, for coming and attending interviews, they get 500 ringgit. But if someone who's hired and, you know, he had to travel more than 100 kilometers just to get the job, he will be provided a thousand ringgit incentive. And this is a one-off incentive, right? So isn't this attractive enough? I'm sure employers uh, are still, I mean, hearing from a lot of uh, their colleagues and they are really looking forward to hire through these incentives, right? So how do we do that? So next slide. All right, very simple steps, right? So we have the platform, the My Future Jobs portal, which I shared with you earlier. That is the platform in which you can hire. We have more than 500,000 active job seekers ready to be matched to the jobs that you have, right? Okay, so you just need to use the platform. You can do your hiring. And the good news is Perqueso provides a lot of value added services, not just the portal. So I would say it's more than a portal. We have case managers behind the portal supporting not only the job seekers, but also the employees. So employees who have you know plenty recruitments needed, we do the filtering for you. We even do the employment. We do virtual career fairs for, for, the, uh, for the employer. We organize it on behalf of the employer. We have it in our offices now that MCOs lifted we on the recovery stage, we are already starting our physical open interviews, of course, with SOP compliant, of course. And, you know, we do hybrid. So employers, we have 54 branches across Malaysia. All you need to do is just get connected to our recruitment officers or our employment services officer who's ready to assist you in matching your uh, recruitment needs. And once you've hired the individual through My Future Jobs, all you need to do is add the person as usual, as any employee would hire a new individual would have to add the person into the SOPSO registry system. And as you've done that, you just have to add his IC on the Panjana Pekerjaya portal, which I've listed on the, on the slide below. Just type in his IC and you can select the list of categories, the different type of categories that are available, which I shared earlier. And once you've done that, it's sent to the approval team. And within one to two days, you get the approval and then you can select your training program. So even if you hire 10 indiv individuals, you can select 10 different training programs based on the need of the, uh, the, the newly hired individual. So we look forward through this uh, partnership to BNCC to this uh, awareness that we've shared with employees who are participating today to, to do come about to work with Pakeso hand in hand, I know for us to work together in providing employment opportunities to the silver, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, how would I say that the incentives that the government has been very kind to provide to all industries. So with that, uh, Phoebe, I would like to end my presentation and thank you very much for listening. And we certainly look forward to hearing and working with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Phoebe, over to you. Thank you, Gayatri, for the very informative session. Next up will be Mr. Philip Lim, General Manager of Malewa Learning Resources, Master Licensee of Direct English UK in Malaysia and Singapore. Philip will be presenting on My MPRO, Empowering Your New Employees for Employment. My MPRO is an upskilling program developed by Malewa Learning Resources that could help address some of the issues or concerns related to unemployment and the program is approved under the Panjana Kerjaya 2.0 initiative. Philip, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you Phoebe for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, uh, I must say that I feel privileged to be part of this webinar. And during these 10 minutes or so, I'll be speaking on Malaysia Employability Program or my MPRO and how this program that we have developed could help empower your employees when they join your companies. Now, uh, from the various surveys and reports that we have read or that we have come across, it is evident that we do have issues with our fresh or, un or unemployed graduates or our job seekers in general when they enter the job market. 
In most instances, we realize that at the point of entry, before they are being absorbed by the companies for employment, most of these new hires are equipped with only their certificates and with the hardware aspects of their knowledge and skills. And uh, more often than not, there'll be many gaps at this entry point. And some of these identified gaps are mainly related to soft skills like English language skills, communication skills, social skills, and creative and critical thinking skills. Okay, now I would like to share with all of you the findings of some of the surveys carried out in the past, which will help illustrate all the gaps that I've just mentioned. Though these surveys were conducted in the past, we believe the situations are still very much the same today. We will start with the Fresh Graduate Report 2018 by jobstreet.com. And in this report, we will look into how employers perceive the standards of fresh graduate in today's job marketplace. Now, in this report, in this report, the top five reasons for fresh graduate unemployment have been identified. And interestingly, two out of the five reasons are related to poor command of English language, 52%, and poor communication skills, 49%. We are also concerned about the other three reasons highlighted in the report, especially the one that states poor character, attitude, and personality with 58% as one of the reasons. In another report by jobstreet.com titled Job Outlook Report 2019, 64% of Malaysian employers say that poor command of English is one of the top reasons why fresh graduates are unemployed. If we look at another study by University of Cambridge titled Global English at Work, it is rather alarming when one of the published findings indicates that 60% of Malaysian workers do not have the necessary English proficiency skills to take advantage of their jobs. This is something that we need to address in our job marketplace, especially when English is not a foreign but officially our second language. The last survey report that I'm going to share with all of you will be the industry survey conducted by uh, Malaysian Employers Federation way back in 2016, but we believe the issues are still the same today. Again, it is alarming to note that 90% uh, of Malaysian employers say that uh, fresh graduates need to improve their English proficiency. Now, in view of all the gaps that I mentioned earlier, uh, Malewa Learning Resources, the Right English Malaysia, takes pride to introduce to all of you our My Empro program, which aims to empower Malaysian employees with the necessary skill sets, particularly around English proficiency, communication skills, and other soft skills for them to be better performers while at work. Uh, we are also very excited for the fact that My Empro is now an approved program under Penjana Kerjaya 2.0. And this program is now accessible to all employers as a fully subsidized program. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me now furnish you with some details on how this program is going to be delivered. Uh, for My Empro, we will need just uh, six days or 42 contact hours for the program to be completed. There is flexibility in our delivery. That is to say, we will have options for our clients or participants to choose either full day or half day training sessions. At the best part, training can be delivered face to face or online. Uh, please be rest assured that we will work out a very friendly and accommodating training schedule for all our clients. Next, we will look at the training contents for My Empro. Uh, we sincerely believe our participants will be excited to know that uh, we will be offering the modules from our highly popular Business English, Direct English UK course as part of the training program. 
as you can see from the slide, uh, these are some of the modules to be offered. Okay, uh, besides our business English modules, we have also added some modules on other soft skills, uh, which we believe are equally important to address some of the gaps that I mentioned earlier in my presentation. As you can see from the screen, we do have modules on personality grooming, problem solving and decision making, as well as social media skills for work purposes. Our MyMPro training will conclude with your employees taking the lingua skill test by Cambridge Assessment English. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on this uh, as we have another speaker who will be doing a full presentation on lingua skill after this. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now talk about our learning materials, our premium learning materials for MyMPro. Uh, all my MPro participants will receive the Business English Learning Pack from Direct English UK. And this learning pack will be delivered to the participants right at their doorstep before the training commences. Uh, upon completion of training, participants will continue to be supported for another six months where they will be given access to another product of ours known as Direct English Interactive. Direct English Interactive is not related to Business English, but it is more to providing the participants with additional learning support if they wish to further enhance their English proficiency level. For awards and certificates, I'm pleased to share with all of you the certificates that the participants will be receiving for completing the program. Uh, we will have our Certificate of Achievement by Direct English UK. There will be another certificate uh, awarded to the participants, uh, our Certificate of Completion by Malewa Learning Resources. And on top of these two certificates, all our participants will also receive the Lingua Skill Test Report. Uh, Lingua Skill Test Report is uh, globally recognized. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we understand uh, that a good product is meaningless if it is not delivered by the right trainer. Uh, at Malewa Learning Resources, Direct English Malaysia, uh, we are blessed to have a team of highly experienced trainers who are all qualified and certified. And we are pleased to inform you that one of our trainers will also be in the discussion panel uh, later in the webinar and we could hear her views with regards to the topic of our discussion today. So uh, I think that's about all from me. Uh, thank you everyone. And please do contact us at Malewa Learning Resources, Direct English Malaysia or BMCC if you require any further information on my MPRO. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Phoebe. Thank you, Philip, for the very insightful presentation. Now we move on to Mr. Henry Lim, Director of the Cambridge Lingua Skill Operations in Malaysia. Henry is speaking on behalf of Cambridge Assessment English, and he will be presenting on Lingua Skill, the globally recognized English proficiency certification test. Over to you, Henry. Thanks, Phoebe. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very, very happy to be here. Uh, Phoebe, let me know if uh, my audio is uh, Subpar. I'll try to do something about it. Um, but uh, as in all things, let me just get this working. As with all presentations, uh, please let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Henry. I'm the Corporate Strategy Director at Saspadi Holdings for Heart. And uh, I would just like to start off by saying that uh, I'm very, very happy, very proud to be here, very, very thankful to be here, to be given this opportunity speak about uh, the importance of English as well as Cambridge English skill. Um, my role here today uh, is twofold. Uh, firstly, I would be uh, I will be giving you or everyone here a little bit more insight into what this Cambridge English skill test is. Uh, as uh, Philip has mentioned earlier, it is included in his program. And also, my second task would be to give everyone here 
some insight into what is developing, you know, uh, in the world of corporate English, um, as well as what what are the latest uh, developments and trends. So, Sasbadi, I represent Sasbadi Education Group. Uh, some of you uh, may know us from your schooling days, but we started off as a publishing company. Uh, but today, we are very diversified uh, in the corporate sector. We are active with uh, different partners around the world, uh, including uh, Lego. We do uh, uh, Lego workshops for corporate, you know, team building, etc. Uh, we partner with Huawei for corporate uh, training positions. Obviously, we are very, very happy to be partners with uh, Direct English, the Lego Group, uh, as well as others. But today, I'm here representing Cambridge Assessment English for their lingua skill test uh, report or what we call as a uh, benchmarking testing and also certification tool for professionals. So what exactly is Cambridge Lingua Skill? Uh, if you are a HR manager or director, I'm sure you're familiar with IELTS, MUET, so on and so forth. So these are the typical um, English tests uh, taken by uh, our Malaysian as well as foreign students fresh grads, so on and so forth. So lingua skill is the professional equivalent for that. Okay, so IELTS and, uh, and MUET, uh, they are usually taken for university admission purposes. Uh, lingua skill is designed for the working world, all right? And uh, uh, basically it is also, uh, uh, I mean, uh, coincidentally, uh, Cambridge Assessment English's uh, most advanced and accurate test taken. So why do I say it is designed for the modern workplace? Well, there are three key criteria that make it very, very uh, attractive and suitable. Uh, number one, the entire testing process is automated, okay, thanks to Cambridge's AI engine. So what it simply means is that uh, um, uh, if a, uh, a, a fresh graduate or a job seeker uh, were to take the test, a new hiree, a potential hiree, for example, uh, there's no marking required on, on behalf of the company, right? Um, everything is done automatically and the results are, are, are marked automatically. So what it means is also speed is, is, is uh, the, the focus here or the priority. The results are available immediately because it is marked by an AI engine or powered by an AI engine. And uh, the results are stored uh, in the cloud. Uh, they can be accessed worldwide uh, within Malaysia, outside of Malaysia, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's uh, very, very good for MNCs, multinational companies. Um, you can actually centralize it uh, from a hub and then distribute it around the world very, very easily. And last but not least, um, um, the lingua skill test is very, very easy to understand and also used uh, with different benchmarks against uh, different positions really, readily available. So this is what it simply means is that uh, not only do you get a score indicating how proficient uh, the person is, but uh, by adopting lingua skill, you can also understand how the scores translate to your different position within your organization. So how does it work? So what I have here is a, a zoomed in version of the uh, test report. And as you can see on the screen, uh, there are uh, many boxes with uh, uh, yellow boxes and also some certain indicators there. So let me just bring everyone through uh, what this, uh, the numbers mean. So first of all, um, just like all Cambridge English tests, uh, lingua skill comes with a numerical indicator. So the, the numerical number indicates the Cambridge English scale and it ranges from 100 to 180. Uh, and it simply gives you an idea of how good or how uh, bad the person's English proficiency level is. Uh, the next indicator that is uh, provided on the, on the test report is the, an alphanumerical label, alphanumerical label. So, uh, and we, and most Malaysians or, or most companies in Malaysia, we are not very, very familiar with this because these alpha numeric label indicates EFR English proficiency band. Uh, and this band starts from band A all the way up to band C, right? So again, very atypical of uh, our Malaysian system where A is good. Uh, the CEFR being an international European standard, uh, it starts from A being a, a beginner, but C, as the highest being competent, right? But I would say that most uh, importantly, right, uh, the, the best thing about this uh, certification tool uh, uh, that makes it very, very useful for uh, hiring as well as positional training is that 
the test allows the different components of the English skill okay, to be tested independently, right? So on the screen, uh, next to the blue arrows, you should see uh, four uh, skills, listening, reading, speaking, and writing. These four skills can be tested separately or together. So you can imagine if you're uh, hiring uh, someone for a middle management position where uh, the person might be writing a lot of reports uh, or, or communicating through email, uh, writing a writing test would be a very, very useful tool, either for upskilling, training, or even hiring. But for someone who is uh, in a position of customer service or frontline or customer facing, speaking is, is, is more suitable. And again, one, one, one I'm trying to highlight here is the flexibility of this tool all right, in, in, for implementation in various different positions, various different positions, as well as work settings. And I mentioned earlier about the benchmarking, you know, uh, it comes ready with benchmarking. So I'm just going to give everyone here just a sneak peek at uh, uh, what this benchmark, uh, the benchmark look like. So here we have uh, uh, just example one of three. So these are, we have benchmarks for operational and administrative positions. Right, the, the back end of the uh, of any organization, we have for frontline client facing positions as well. These are all mapped out. So L S R and W refers to listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And uh, this last example here, uh, not only do we have for back end and also the front end, we also have uh, a benchmarking done for uh, what do you call it, the technical positions as well and specialist. Uh, the the uh, CEFR bands here, some of you may be wondering, okay, so uh, how was this done, you know? So these uh, benchmarks were done uh, via a global study, okay, uh, through the Occupational Information Network. And from there, uh, we work together with uh, Cambridge to translate them or to equate them, to map them to the CEFR level, okay? So uh, these are not uh, bands that were plucked out of thin air but they were done or backed up by a proper uh, international global study. So lingua skill, um, how does it benefit uh, us or corporates uh, in these pandemic times? Right? Um, of course, I would say that the first thing that I have noticed from a global perspective is that we, we have seen how English, um, or I would say the English skill actually, uh, has helped individuals open doors to different industries despite being uh, entrenched, for example. And this is simply because English, in my opinion, uh, is one of the most transferable skills that anyone can have, okay? Uh, transferable soft skills that anybody can have. So, uh, especially in Malaysia, I know as an employer myself, um, I look for uh, what do you call it, uh, hirees with good English, especially uh, in writing and so lingua skill uh, is a very, very good tool uh, for HR uh, companies to implement uh, within your own organization. And implementation couldn't be easier. Uh, everything runs from the cloud. There's no need to maintain a server. There's no need to install anything in any uh, uh, PC or laptop. All uh, the uh, organization needs is a headset, a laptop or a PC and a connection to the internet and you're good to go. And secondly, lingua skill, uh, which is what uh, we have done here uh, in partnership with Malewa and Direct English, is to use it for training, upskilling, and reskilling purposes. So lingua skill's role is to ensure effective outcomes, right? The results are measurable, uh, they are aligned to international standards, uh, and uh, they are, uh, what do you call it, tran uh, translatable. You can understand what those uh, results are. And in case you're wondering um, uh, who are the, uh, or what companies or corporates uh, are using, which ones of, of them are using in the world, uh, here's just a quick, a, a small little snapshot of uh, uh, the companies that currently adopt lingua skill, either for training or hiring purposes. And uh, you can see that there are a couple of uh, big brands there. Uh, the last line is not really corporate, but uh, it's government and government agency related. So uh, I'm happy to say that Pekeso uh, has also used lingua skill for their internal training uh, via some of our other partners. Uh, MOHT and MOE, they recognize it. And last but not least, the Malaysian Qualification, qualification uh, Agency also recognizes Cambridge lingua skill. And uh, I would like to wrap up my session by just uh, 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 giving you some insight on, uh, on, on how
how this uh, tool can be used or the various ways it can be used uh, if you're interested uh, or, or, or currently thinking about how to uh, use this to improve your competitive advantage in your corporate or as a culture building uh, tool, right? And indeed, uh, there are three things that you should consider, okay, uh, before uh, taking on thing with you. Firstly, please identify or you would need to identify which positions in your organization are English critical. And I will explain English critical uh, in a second, but it simply means that uh, these are positions where English is absolutely essential uh, for the success of the uh, particular uh, position. Secondly, what is the English proficiency benchmark for that position? So once you know what the positions are, what you will need to figure out what are the proficiency uh, benchmarks for that position, and uh, with, from that, uh, we can identify, uh, you know, uh, what types of talents we need to hire, as well as what kind of training programs uh, we need to send the existing staff or new staff for. And last but not least, uh, how should you integrate or introduce these requirements in your organization? And just as uh, any other HR policy, new policy, or, or, or uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, practices, these take time, all right? And I would always uh, advise to take baby steps instead of quantum leaps, okay? Take baby steps, uh, start small, and then slowly build up from there. And uh, here are a couple of examples of English critical positions uh, that I've uh, uh, talked about. So right at the top, uh, employees working in corporate relations, right? Uh, these are uh, absolutely uh, essential uh, for big multinational corporates or even large companies, uh, specialists in human resources, staff employees in human resources, middle management. Now, as an employer, um, I find that the middle management staff is, is always the layer uh, which is often overlooked, but where English is actually very, very critical. And this is because, um, you know, middle management uh, staff, uh, they are being asked to do so much uh, communication work, right? whether it is um, you know, writing emails or speaking on the phone or doing presentations, so on and so forth with the outside world. But internally as well, you know, uh, from a cultural building standpoint, uh, I've heard of or I've personally experienced many, many conflicts, fights, or, or you know, and, and a lot of misunderstanding uh, to start with the poor grasp of the English language. And it's very, very unintentional as a result, right? So middle management is something that uh, I believe all of you uh, will sort of agree with me, right? That it is a very, very important layer to think about. Sales and marketing division certainly uh, depends on what kinds of uh, products uh, and brands you're representing, right? Uh, if you're representing a global brand, uh, certainly English is very, very critical. And last but not least, uh, client-facing division. So if you are, uh, uh, you know, a, a running or in the hoteling business or tourism business or service uh, businesses, um, client facing staff uh, not only uh, uh, protects the brand or gives the brand a, a very, very good, uh, 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 it makes the brand look good, but it also opens up new markets, right, uh, for yourself, uh, for, the, for the business and for the organization. So again, very, very critical. And with that, uh, before I hand it back to Phoebe, uh, just to wrap up, uh, we currently provide a professional advisory service free of charge as a service. So if uh, any of you uh, would like to understand more about how these benchmarks are derived or how they can be implemented in your organization, you know, we do baby steps. Uh, we look at the critical position first. Feel free to drop me an email and I'll be uh, very, very glad to help you. All right, back to you, Phoebe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Henry. That's very useful information. Now we move on to the panel discussion, and I will hand over to the CEO of BMCC, Ms. Jennifer Lopez. Over to you, Jen. Thank you, Phoebe. A very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, before we begin the panel session, let me just take this opportunity to thank Direct English, a member of the esteemed member of the BMCC for your trust and collaboration on this timely program. You know, where during these challenging times, employers are seriously considering or reconsidering their recruitment plans. Thank you to all the speakers just now. It was truly an insightful presentation by all three speakers. 
We do have a number of questions. Uh, later, we will address it during the Q&A session. So now, uh, moving on to the panel discussion, we are delighted and honoured to have with us an esteemed panel this afternoon who are well versed with the subject as well as you know, reading from their CVs, very passionate about talent and people development. So just to reintroduce our panelists again very quickly, we have with us Yang Mulia Tunku Datuk Suri Dr. Iskandar, the Group Executive Chairman of Malewa Group. And then we have the CEO of Pekeso, very honoured, Datuk Sri Dr. Muhammad Azman. Datuk, I know you are a medical doctor by profession, yeah? I read your CV. Um, yes. We have that <laughs> the right person to lead the organisation. Dato uh, Aminatu Hare, the ambas ambassador, cross-cultural communicator, uh, certified trainer representing Malewa Learning Resources and Direct English Malaysia. And well honoured to also have with us Yang Bahagia Dato Haji Samsudin Badan. Dato, we met at your office. He is executive director of the Malaysian Employers Federation. The BMCC just became the member of MEF and we hope to, you know, such a good work that MEF does. And I'm sure our members will find, you know, our membership very, very valuable. I am, I, I've Thank gone you, to Thank you, Bibi. Thank you. Yeah. Jennifer here. Jennifer Dato. <laughs> we met in your office. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. The government has definitely recognized the importance of uh, upskilling workers to contribute to the economy and especially the recovery. And this is evident by the two billion you know, allocation announced in the last budget for Panjana Kajaya 2.0, uh, which includes hiring incentives and training programs. As we heard from Gayati's uh, presentation just now, it is highly, I mean, this is my first time really listening fully and highly attractive and commendable scheme, I would say. So Dato, I think on the, uh, this is to Dato uh, Sri Muhammad, right? Um, on the top of everyone's mind is, what, how has it been the take up rate for the Panjana Kajaya 2.0, especially for the tire, uh, hiring and training scheme, rehiring and training scheme, Dato? Could you pl please share with us since the launch? What's the take up been? Thank you, Jennifer. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and good afternoon uh, to all the distinguished uh, panelists and speakers. Uh, first and foremost, I would like, I would like to thank. Uh, British Malaysian Chamber of Commerce, BMCC, for inviting me to this significant webinar that is on the initiatives uh, Perkeso is uh, actually managing through all the allocation given by government, uh, particularly working with uh, what, uh, has, uh, what we have mentioned earlier. Let, let me reiterate what uh, Gaya have shared with you. Uh, which uh, we are focusing on hiring incentive where employers obtain up to 6,000 worth of incentive up to six months and reskilling, upskilling initiative, but also the My Future Jobs uh, portal, which has been responsible for matching our vacancies to job seekers. And on top of that, uh, this portal uh, is based on real time data and capable to provide granular supply and demand information that has been presented and deliberated at the highest uh, level at the National Employment Council, chaired by uh, Mahmoud Muhammad, uh, PM himself. Uh, this is where uh, the outcome of this hiring incent incentive, the take-up rate. Uh, as of today, we have achieved the placement targets for the month of January up to March 10, 2021, where about 31,947 individuals have been hired. Uh, from the number, about 23,360, about 73% 73 of the application for the hiring incentive have been submitted by over 4,000 employers. So in total, we have successfully uh, placed close to 200,000 unemployed individuals through the Penjana Kejaya 1.0 and 2.0 since it was launched in June 2020. So we are positive that with the uplift of MCO and with the vaccine in place, uh, we expect to see more economic activities that will stimulate job creation. If each employer can play its role to hire 
uh, one unemployed individual, together we can make a difference. Employers uh, don't need to worry too much if they don't have complete uh, matching requirement. And that is why we have the reskilling provision in the program, which looks into that aspect. In total, close to about 45,000 individuals have been benefited from the training under Penjana. So this is some of the outcome that I would like to share with the panelists um, uh, since it was launched and initiated uh, allocation from the government and the program uh, was uh, actually managed by Perkeso. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dato. I, I take the point that if, if each employee hire, employer hires one, then we all can make a difference. That's a good takeaway that, you know, employers to consider as contributing back to the, I mean, contributing to our economy recovery and keeping people on jobs, right? So um, I will go, as a follow-up to this question, I will go to the employer, from the employer perspective and the trainer perspective itself. Uh, let, I will start with um, Tuanku, Tuanku. Do you think the current hiring incentives under Penjana 2.0 is attractive enough for employers currently uh, in hiring, especially you know current crisis when everyone is trying to balance your finances, right? Hi, assalamualaikum <clears throat> and salam sejahtera. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, BMCC very much for including me on this panel. And uh, I'm very pleased that we have to see, we are able to see all of us here uh, gathered to come to be together to address the subject matter. Yes, yeah, certainly, I think we need to have that uh, both employers and job seekers should know more about the uh, programs under PAKESO. And I am very much encouraged to uh, hear that was free Muhammad's uh, update on the take up. Uh, of uh, the initiatives done by Pekeso. And I hope that the, uh, this webinar will help to bring uh, this information uh, to the public much more. Uh, and as well as, uh, of course, the, the programs that we are talking about today uh, under the uh, Penjana 2.0 initiative for, for Pekeso. So I, I believe that um, it is, a, it is interesting and it is attractive, but employers and job seekers need to know much more. And I think sometimes I feel that they don't go out and look for this information. And there would be um, some people wait to be spoon fed this information. So uh, this is what I, my, my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tonku. Tonku, uh, a good point that you made. Many people are not aware of the the benefits that are available. So such a program, we are happy to collaborate with, uh, you know, Direct English and Malewa Group to share this information more. I'd like to go to uh, Dato Samsude. Dato, you from the, yourself from the employer perspective, do you think your employers uh, are aware and what are their perspectives on this Panjana 2.0 Kajaya? Microphone. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi A very good afternoon to everybody, uh, panelists and also the participants. Yeah. Thank you very much, BMCC, for joining MEF as a member. That uh, re We really appreciate that. And of course, uh, I think uh, what had been explained and stated by Dato, uh, Dr. Sri uh, Muhammad is, I think, very commendable. It, it just imagines, for example, Last year, this program was able to actually uh, place about more than 200,000 uh, employees. And even up during this period, for 2021, more than 31,000 employees were able to be placed. And I, I think that is a very commendable effort indeed. Yeah? And of course, I think we appreciate the kind of uh, schemes introduced by the government, a true precursor to, to actually assist employers in trying to engage new employees and also employees that are being retrenched during this hard period. And of course, I mean, in a, in a larger uh, situation, 
the government had come up with various incentives to actually incentivize employers not to retrench employees. And that I would say is commendable. More than 2.7 million employees uh, actually being, being assisted in during the WSP program. Yeah, it, I think it is uh, being continued now, but only possibly to the hotel and the tourism sector kind of thing. And of course, we had actually pleaded the, the government so that this scheme be extended to all sectors of the economy so that we are able to actually retain more employees and not retrenching employees uh, during this period. Then I think uh, what, what is important here is that, yes, we, we had that in our scheme, uh, but of course, we as employers had actually uh, raised this issue with the government, with MOF directly to say that uh, possibly as employers now, our ability to employ employees on a longer term basis is very much challenged. And of course, uh, we, we, if we are being, being put up with a parameter to say that, okay, look, you must employ them for one year, uh, that is really very challenging because as employers, we are not very sure of our own existence, of our own sustainability as to whether we can actually go up to one year from now, thing like that. That's why uh, we, we had suggested to the MOF to, to say that why, why not we actually, you know, assist employers within the program, even if the employment opportunity is less than one year. Even, even we're talking about six months or even seven months or even four months, for example. And that, I think, is still something I think that, that should be assisted under the Punjana program so that employers are actually encouraged to actually uh, take up uh, what whoever is uh, seeking employment. Uh, I, I believe that there are a lot of uh, people being, being registered uh, under the My Future Jobs. Yeah? Uh, and, and of course, uh, the numbers uh, last year, I believe is more than 700,000 kind of thing. And this year also, I think we expect that the figures of uh, job seekers are also going to be very high, thing like that. But again, you know, uh, there are also, I think, uh, a lot of employers that had advertised for vacancies, things like that. And of course, I think that the, the, the matching uh, of the, 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 the job seekers and the employers seeking for employees uh, are not an easy task, really. And, and of course, I, I really commend uh, that my future jobs, uh, you know, led by uh, Dr. Sri Azman on this particular aspect. So, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Dato. Uh, I, I actually want to echo uh, Dato Samsudin on that. Uh, Dato, uh, Dato Sri, uh, Dr. Mohammed, if you could consider that, you know, during these challenging times, um, you know, perhaps, you know, to consider below one year. In fact, I want to go a bit more and request for CASO or even MOF to consider if this scheme can be extended to for retention of uh, employees because uh, we have been engaging with a lot of employees and during these challenging times, you know, companies are looking at ways to retain. And I know we are concerned about rehiring, but it's no, not to contribute more into the unemployment market. Perhaps, you know, the 2 billion can also be considered at the next stage for, for our suggestion of to extend uh, to below one year and also for, to consider if, because like a program like My MyEmpro is really uh, good. We, we have been supporting a direct English uh, to engage with employers and they asked, could we give it to our existing employees to reskill them during this pandemic? So it's just a suggestion for your consideration, Dato Sri uh, Muhammad, doctor. Yeah, for your consideration. You want me, you want me to respond to that? You can, you can. We're just asking I you just to consider. We, we are here to share and also to deliberate and come up with the ideas. But the allocation come from the government. Uh, if, you are, you, if you're asking me about the retaining of workers, yes, the wage subsidy itself is actually one of the way, the initiative, uh, in order for the employers to retain workers. But I believe that uh, at this point of time, as mentioned by Dato Aji Samsudin, uh, we are focusing on uh, the tourism industry and also uh, any activity related to the tourism that we're going to extend the wage subsidy. But I believe that if this pandemic continue, 
and uh, we we need to get the government to allocate more and also open up more industries. Uh, it is up to Ministry of Finance to decide on that. But we are here as organisation to manage whatever decision by the government. So, uh, of course. Uh, I think we long looking forward. Of course, we need to provide. Uh, I mean, good initiative to retain workers because this 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 has already proven from five point uh, highest five point three percent of unemployment rate. Now we are getting between four to seven, four point seven to four point eight. So this shows that actually the initiative to retain workers is in place. Okay, thank you, Dato. Just uh, just for your consideration and views from the people that we spoke to, just sharing, taking the opportunity. Now, uh, let me go to Dato Aminato. I mean, Dato, um, your views, uh, Dato, on this uh, Penjana Kejaya, Penjana Tupano Kejaya, and do you think, uh, is there anything from, as a certified trainer and being, you know, a communicator and you know, as a certified trainer, you engage with the, the, the trainees, you know, uh, is there anything else that can make, it more attractive to employers themselves, employers. Your views, Dato. Mm, thank you, Jennifer. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to be part of this uh, BMCC panel today and to share my views. Uh, frankly speaking, I'm very, very concerned with uh, the declining standards. Uh, Mr. Lim, earlier he shared uh, the data and it is um, concerning and having been a diplomat for more than 36 years, you know, I and being from the older generation, I could see, you know, the decline and especially when you're abroad and you meet your colleagues, you know, even from the ASEAN countries, right? And they are, you know, uh, becoming more and more competent and, and here we are um, for the most part struggling, yeah? So um, I'm glad really that uh, I was invited to join the team of trainers for, uh, for the Malewa group and the Red English specifically. I've had the opportunity to work with them. And I think they have a very niche and uh, specialized program, uh, especially for the uh, business English. And um, what, uh, you know, the niche and what we do actually as trainers, you know, um, most of us are coming from very experienced backgrounds. And I think that is really, really important. We have so many training companies, government as well. I was with our Institute of Diplomacy before, you know, we also train in English, but you need to have um, a really niche and specialized um, institutions that are doing this you know, as the bread and butter. And I must say that um, this is where, um, you know, uh, when the Direct English came up with this YMFO program, I mean, that is really, really um, a very good program because it encompasses, it's wholesome, it encompasses everything. And, um, you know, um, other than the focus on English, of course, they are looking at uh, having, you know, um, the participants think critically, which is very important, which is very lacking actually among Malaysians, you know, and therefore the components that uh, they have put in, other than the um, a simple everyday communication for frontliners, for receptions and, and the like, you know, um, the more substantive um, uh, modules they have of presentation, as uh, presentation skills on the, um, um, critical thinking in terms of um, um, decision making, problem solving, that is very, very important. And I think more and more of our companies should set aside the budget for this, you know, come and join us and, um, you know, and take it from there. Yeah. Um, and of course, I, I'm very appreciative of the government initiative now. Yeah, what Pukeso is doing. In fact, right now we are running a program with Pukeso as well, uh, specifically on English, um, you know, where we are um, engaging with interested participants on a variety of subjects. Yeah, we cover things like uh, from grooming their English to even write, uh, resume writing and all that. And that can only help because right now uh, we, uh, Malaysia, we are losing out. Yeah, and I think it has had a direct impact 
on our competitiveness. The fact that we do not have the high standards of English that we used to have. Yeah, even compared, as I said, to our ASEAN neighbors. Yeah, I hope that answered some of your questions, Jennifer. Yes, uh, thank you, Dato. Dato, you have nicely uh, segued into the next uh, part of the session. The first part was on, you know, uh, everyone sharing their views. Definitely the Panjana 2.0 uh, by the government and what's been offered by Pekeso is highly uh, commendable. I would think all of us agree, right? It's highly commendable and it's out there for the, you know, the employers to take that opportunity. Yeah, I think many employers are not really looking at opportunity, perhaps they don't understand. So we look forward to working with Picasso and Direct English and even MEF to get that message across to employers. As uh, Tato said, one employee will can, you know, by hired by one employee, we all can can make a difference. So uh, Dato Aminatun, we, you have nicely brought us to the next part where the lack of English competency among the new graduates, right? And uh, we hear you and we see the, you know, continuous de declining at a rate at the moment. But the surveys also showed in terms of the MEF survey, right? This goes to Dato Samsudin. You know, perhaps you want to add for the part that apart from English, and poor communication, just now Philip's presentation also touched about poor attitudes and characters. So Dato Shamsuddin, can you uh, elaborate of, uh, about these findings on your MEF survey? Uh, thank you, Jennifer, again. Yeah. Yes, uh, the other parts, uh, apart from the uh, issues on English communication, but perhaps just, just I want to touch a bit on this issue of English communication. Unfortunately, uh, many quarters had said that we employers are always uh, trying to avoid employing Malaysians. That's why we say that we want to have a good English uh, communication skill. And always uh, they, they wanted to politicize the subject to say that it's a form of discrimination, thing like that. To me, uh, I would say there's nothing discriminatory about employers requiring uh, new graduates to be good in English because it's part of the job requirement. And uh, other skills that, of course, need to be taken up by, by graduates is uh, basically, I, I would say that, uh, you know, the attitude uh, need to possibly be, be, be uh, you know, relook. Uh, and I think universities need to really uh, impart this to all the graduates. No? When I say attitudes, it's attitudes uh, towards work. And, and of course, uh, you know, we, we when, when we try to hire uh, fresh graduates that, like that. One of the issues that we face as employees is basically uh, the new graduates are asking for unrealistic uh, wage level. Yeah. And, and I think this is something that I think we need to address this uh, as a nation. And of course, uh, you know, this doesn't help when actually some quarters say, uh, yes, uh, you know, graduates, a single person need to so much, so much for them to live uh, comfortably in Kuala Lumpur, thing like that. And to me, you know, we are so fixated on the issue of, of the starting pay. I, I, I think as, as employees, as fresh graduates, I think we should not be putting too much emphasis on, on the starting pay, because starting pay is just starting pay. And you know that in the private sector, you may start, say, example, 1,005 or 1,008 or 2,000 ringgit, but you're wages is not going to be static like that. Once you're, 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 you prove yourself to be really of an asset to the company, the company would basically review your wages. You don't have to wait for one year to get a pay review thing like that. Possibly once you're confirmed, then you will be given certain amount of increases in, in your, your basic pay thing like that. So to, so to me, you know, don't just you know, spend too much time arguing about basic wages. Yes, I mean, talking about, about basic wages, if you are talking about, say, 40 years ago, you know, a graduate may be paid 1,600 ringgit as starting pay. But now the starting pay is about 2,000 plus only. It's, the difference is, is not that high. But what is important is, uh, you know, for, for the graduate concern to really put in the efforts to show that you are really an asset to the company. I think beyond that, really, the, 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 the sky is the limit. Yeah. So, so I think it's important for, for actually graduates to change their mindset and, and don't just look at executive 
position. I really like, for example, the, 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 the examples given uh, in Japan, the practices being practiced in Japan, you know, where even in university, they started to actually come to the company, not doing executive job, but possibly started as, as, a, as a toilet cleaner kind of thing and observe how things are done done by the other executive in the company. And that's how you actually start to know the, 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 the life at, at the workplace. So it, I think it's important for us to really educate our fresh graduate with all this kind of skill so that at the end of the day, when he actually graduated on the third year or fourth year, then he is work ready. Rather than what we are trying to do now is basically we, 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 we find that when the graduates are, are really, uh, you know, out of the university, they are not yet work, uh, work ready and the government has to spend billions of money to trying to make them employable. And I think somehow we need to actually, uh, you know, uh, revamp the way we do things so that the graduates will be ready when they are, they are out of the institutions. So thank you very much. Dato, I agree with that. And this is the message I think uh, some, some of the higher institutions are aware and many of them have put in. But it is the graduates themselves, sometimes when they come out, they have that attitude, especially the, you know. So so now I want to ask this um, a bit difficult question to Tunku. Tunku, how do you think, um, you know, apart from English, all of us agree that English is such an important, um, you know, uh, competency to have and how would the my and pro from direct english address this issue i know uh, philip mentioned about a few of the competency skills but what can the trainers or what can the employers get from my and pro to address some of these real concerns about attitude and um, some of the soft skills Tunku, your 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 mic is muted hey, sorry <laughs> Thank you very much, Jennifer. Maybe I'll take the, the uh, question or the, the, what you asked me in a wider sense. Uh, as, as we all know, it goes without saying, the past 12 months, speaking as an employer, the past 12 months have been uh, stressful for both employers as well as employees, of course. And employers whose companies have been negatively affected by the pandemic will try their best to retain their work. Rate, uh, workforce as best they can. But, but if uh, push comes to shove, they have to start making tough decisions on who to keep and who to let go and who to let go or put on a scheme to reduce costs. Now, this is not the forum to discuss this, but among the criteria that employers use to make such decisions is also uh, actually a similar uh, criteria that employers use to hire new employees. So um, we won't talk about qualifications, degrees and certificates and all that, but the more relevant skills will be the soft skills uh, needed for business 4.0. Now this 4.0, we all hear it all the time, 4.0 business has been um, enabled or pushed in by industry 4.0. Uh, <clears throat> so the society or community has been pushed has pulled every one of us, for example, into IT or digital skills necessary to be uh, adept and fluent in uh, being able to uh, navigate the net or the web. Uh, and what may separate the men from the boys and the women from the girls will be the ability to communicate fluently in a language that is used by, as we all know, 360 million people worldwide and so on and so forth. So we, we do have skeptics who say, hey, the national language is very important and it, so it is. But in the scenario that we're looking at employing, uh, re-employing or hiring in Malaysia is that we're talking about Malaysians who should already be fluent in their command of, uh, of the Malay language. Thus the, 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 the scenario will be that uh, local companies who are seeking to hire uh, new uh, people or rehire people they've let go uh, will be the um, where they can fit them in into the organizations. And they may be multinationals that uh, who need people actually uh, who can communicate internally with their employees, with their existing employees and with their externally with their customers and suppliers. 
And uh, for all you know, those companies may be even uh, some, the multinational ones, may be even considering to uh, transfer people to their overseas office, uh, loca office locations and so on. So um, what can set people apart from the others will be this, what uh, both Philip and, uh, and Henry had talked about earlier with um, my MPro skills and, and, and uh, linguist skills. So uh, I think this, this in, in, a, in a way puts us where we need to be regarding uh, looking at the entire picture, the bigger picture of where we need to uh, take our new employees and rehiring of employees to. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Um, Dato, what you have said is that, sorry, Tonku, Tonku. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Rightfully said, you know, what, what um, the employees can do with being equipped with the right English competency, right? So good messages there. Can I, may I go to Dato Aminatun? Would you like to add any to anything to that point uh, Tonku has mentioned, especially if you directly deal with some of these students that, themselves, the, the employees, when you train them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, actually, I've had very good experience with Malaysian employees. They're very, very enthusiastic when you engage them. And how we do it, how you keep them engaged is to actually have blended learning. You know, you just don't go and use the handbook and the audio. You actually use videos. You just use group exercises. Yeah, and that's what we have been doing. And we find that they're very forthcoming, you know. And of course, other than the pure English uh, subjects, you know, again, because we have a very diverse and experienced uh, trainers, what we have been doing is to um, bring in our own anecdotes, our own experiences during the sessions, you know, and that's well appreciated, actually, you know, and... Um, so again, other than the pure English, I would think that, um, you know, it's, it's good that we also bring in complementary uh, modules, you know, as uh, Philip had mentioned earlier, things like personality grooming. You know, you'll be surprised. Many people don't, when they think of personality grooming, they think immediately, is oh, how do I look? How do I dress? So on and so forth, right? But it goes beyond that, you know. So it, it involves the outer inner self, you know, it, how you bring about positive change, how you present yourself as a person. And that in itself, um, as um, some of our other panelists were mentioning, that's very critical when an employer looks at you, you know, and you bring with yourself this self-confidence, high self-esteem, you know, other than, of course, as you said, very good communication skills, you will, of course, supersede and you will be highly placed as compared to someone who comes in, you know, um, either than being nervous, of course, everyone, every new uh, person who comes in would be very nervous, right? But this confidence, it will come out, you know, the positive attitudes and all that. So that's why we need to complement it, you know? And again, it's, I go back to the fact that we need uh, to have people, uh, employees who think critically, yeah? You know, sometimes through my own experience, you know, I talk to a young person and they can't even comprehend what you're saying. What more to give you feedback and assess what you have said. You know, I've, I've been in situations where when you mention, okay, what's the salient point of our conversation just now? And they just can't even decipher that. They can't even pinpoint, oh, you know, you said this, 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 you know, instead they go and beat around the bush, right? And that comes from not having fluent English, not being articulate, you know, and not um, being mentally agile, you know? So um, I think, uh, that again, I think uh, that is basically what Direct English has been trying to do, you know, to bring in those elements as well. So we have to have, other than the pure English subjects, we need to have these complementary subjects. And in particular, those two that I mentioned. And of course, they have um, moved on. They've included things like managing change. They have included uh, social uh, use of social media for business purposes, which are very good, really, because many a time, uh, you know, uh, people don't even know how to write emails, for instance, for business. 
yeah, when they apply for jobs, you know. So uh, these are the, some of the things um, I think we should, uh, employers should give uh, attention to, employees should give attention to as well. Um, is that okay. right? all right? Yes, okay. excellent, excellent that, uh, that I think what you said in terms of, um, you know, the additional supplementary skills are so important. I'm sure the employers that are listening in today will definitely agree with you. You know, excellent points. And also when you have this extra supplementary skills that the My Empro is uh, providing, it will raise the confidence of the employees. You know, self-confidence and self-esteem is something that really, once you have that, people can start to think, start to articulate. I think that's very important. Then there was the, the more they speak, then the confidence in ma mastering the English language can come along. I truly believe what you said is very valuable and employees will agree. So um, actually, unfortunately, I see we only have 10 minutes left and I'm sure Philip is eager to answer some of the questions addressed. So I would just like to ask um, you know, the panelists any parting or last, uh, last words of wisdom from our uh, Dato, Dato, Dr. Samsudi, Dato, sorry, Dato uh, Muhammad had to leave earlier because of some emergency, but we still have our three other panelists. Um, let's go with Tunku, some, uh, you know, a few words, uh, you know, for the employers out there, why they should consider this program and why they should consider hiring. Tunku, your mic. Sorry, <laughs> I keep doing that. I keep doing that. Well, um, yes, we. Uh, this is the time to hire. Actually, we uh, mm. come across the. Uh, I think the the worst, uh, past the worst of the uh, pandemic. We're now coming to the upswing. We should be coming to the upswing. The vaccines are coming into place, and we should now be thinking of re uh, boosting our resources, which includes hiring of uh, people, uh, resources and people to uh, and re-enter our company. Uh, many, com I, I'm, the other companies, the other industry I'm involved with is uh, tourism. And in tourism, we've seen uh, one of the worst uh, times ever. And uh, many people have had to uh, be let go or put on some program. But uh, I think, I believe some of them with the recent changes, not just there, but in also in manufacturing, and uh, agriculture, people are looking at rehiring. And this is the time I think to put, uh, to rehire. And but when they do rehire this time, employers are going to look at different kinds of skills, skill sets. So this is where we come in, uh, where we've yes. been talking just now. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. Uh, Dato Samsudi? Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Uh, I, I totally agree with uh, Tinku Dato Sri. Uh, that yes, uh, possibly this is time that uh, employers should uh, start to look more positive yeah, and start to hire, if not in a big way, start to hire. And, and of course, I think what's important is that uh, you know, we should be able to be there when our clients are asking for our products, our services, things like that. And if we are not prepared uh, you know, from now, then possibly we may miss some of the orders by the clients or we may not be able to service the clients, thing like that. And in order for us as employers to avoid that kind of situation, I think we need to reassess the situation and be ready for the possibly uh, economic recovery. Yeah, but of course, uh, I mean, we, we also need to be a bit cautious in the sense that, that economic recovery may take some time. Some say that uh, not this year, don't talk about recovery. You're talking about uh, coming back to the pre-COVID-19 situation, possibly wait until next year kind of thing. But of course, I mean, these this are possibly different, uh, difficult issues for us to consider as employers. But I think what is important also, uh, I think on the part of the new graduates and also employees is very, very critical for them to really embrace uh, the, the, the new technology because that's the only way for us to actually move forward. And as employers, of course, we also need to embrace this new technology and avoid situation where we, we will be left out in, in terms of technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dato Samsudin. And um, Dato Aminatun, your last words, please, for um, the webinar. 
Yes. Um, well, uh, since I'm a trainer, I would be talking from the perspective of the employee, right? Yeah, I agree that it's time to rehire, but as employees also, they need to uh, look at themselves, prepare themselves. And, you know, um, we have sp spoken so much about reskilling and upskilling. It's something that I'm passionate about. Um, and it is inner skilling, you know, uh, as employees, as employers, we should be looking at things like uh, uh, simply simple things, but get back to basics like discipline, like accountability, like having respect, yeah, having pride in work. And I'm so sorry to say that we are now going, we are lacking that way, yeah. And as an employee, when you come and you present yourself with those good qualities, the inner qualities as well, immediately you will you know, uh, supersede the others, you know, will be recognized as, uh, you know, if you are a committed uh, worker, for instance, yeah, I think employers would, uh, would appreciate that. And not only that, but ultimately it's good for the employers, right? Your company will have better productivity. It's as simple as that when you have committed disciplined uh, workers. So that's, that's what I want to leave uh, the discussion with, you know, the thought, that thought. For Thank you. employers to consider as well to work on inner skilling as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dato. Thank you to all our panelists. It was really valuable information. I trust our audience will, you know, agree with me. You know, we learned some new terms like inner inner skilling is really important to raise that self confidence. Thank you for all your feedback. I will. Uh, unfortunately, we are really short of time, so I have to go back to. Uh, I'm not going to go back to um, Phoebe, but I think I'm still uh, I'm supposed to do the Q and A session. So Philip, Philip, um, there are yes. some the questions are very straightforward. Philip, I'm sure you yes. had a chance. So perhaps you want to take on the question four, uh, seven, and eight instead of me repeating. If you just could just read out the question and give your answer. Uh, seven and eight. Okay. Uh, what is the class group size for my Ampro? Uh, will yes. it be a very big group? Yeah, that, that's the question, right? Yeah, I think yes. probably some employers will have concern uh, whether we are looking at very big group for the class to be effective. Uh, but what I would like to say is, uh, of course, ideally, we would prefer to have a group of group size of between 15 and 20 participants in my MPRO. But we understand uh, that is not easy to... Uh, uh, that is going to be challenging because different employers will have different sets of requirements, expectations when it comes to training schedule. So uh, having said that, we'll be happy to start a class or a group even with just 10 or below 10, it doesn't matter. Uh, if any companies, if you have enough takers from your company, uh, we will work out a schedule that suits you best. So we are, we are very accommodating, we will look at all your needs and we will uh, definitely be able to deliver uh, the training in any group size. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay. So basically, uh, Philip, I hear that if they have any questions regarding the My Pro, they can reach out to you directly or even reach out to BMCC because as a partner for this program, right? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, then they also have a question on if a, the employee is new, in January 2021, and, and uh, maybe this is also for Gayatri, if they have not registered on the Panjana portal, uh, My Future Jobs portal, will they be entitled to these incentives? Yeah, yeah, happy to share that for the Panjana 2.0, as long as it's the hiring that has taken place from December 21st, 2020 onwards, can come onto the Panjana. So as long as you abide the hiring period from that period right up to I trust that it's going to be up to uh, available up to end of December. Uh, yes, the employer can come and uh, apply for the incentives. Okay, um, Gayatri, over to uh, is this is the first question I think to be fair to answer, right? Uh, a pers um, is a new company eligible for hire for this hiring incentives? Yes, they are. So we are not so, like the wage subsidy. The wage subsidy, they had certain conditions on the start date of the company, but for the hiring incentives, no. So a new company can, uh, you know, uh, benefit from the hiring incentives as well. Okay. Um, 
Okay, the next question is uh, incentive under 40 years old, what does it mean when they mention 40% from the wages and maximum incentive is 4,000? 4, 4, Can I have an example or more details? Yeah, sure. So if you see 40% is basically um, based on the 10,000 uh, ringgit salary, which is based there. So meaning that an employer can, if you are taking the 40%, if you hire someone who's below 40, you'll be able to get a maximum incentive of 4,000 ringgit. So if I give you an example, if his salary is 1,500 ringgit, so 40% of that is 600 ringgit, meaning that every month the employer will be able to get an incentives worth 600 ringgit for up to six uh, months per individual. Yeah, so I hope that that is clear to the uh, question asked, right? Yes. Okay, um, we have come to the 4 p.m. mark. So this question is for Phoebe. Phoebe, should we uh, go, well, well, and also to the speakers, there are some questions that will you all be able to respond to the panelists uh, after the webinar? It's very direct questions. Yes, we will. We'll follow up with those that we didn't get to. Yes, so some very good questions. I'm sure Philip, you'll be very happy to have these questions so you can uh, reach out to the employers. It uh, shows that there's much interest for the program. So um, with that, I once again, thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I will pass the session back to Phoebe, Phoebe to do the closing. Thank you, Jen. Um, that brings us to the end of our webinar. Thank you very much to all the esteemed speakers and panelists for your time, for sharing your valuable expertise and for the very insightful discussion today. Thank you also to everyone who sent in your questions. And as Jen mentioned, um, if we haven't answered your questions, we will follow up with you after the webinar. Um, I will also be sharing my email address so you can get in touch with me. Thank you also to the BMCC team who assisted behind the scenes to make this happen. We hope you'll join us again for other webinars in the future. We have a couple of upcoming webinars, Women in Leadership on 20th March, which is a celebration of the International Women's Day and Race to Zero on 25th March, which is a focus, which focuses on climate change. For more information and registration, please visit our BMCC website, www.bmcc.org.my. Once again, thank you for attending. Take care, stay safe and healthy.